Everyone. Hello. Good morning. Good Hi. morning. Good morning. Um, welcome to this panel discussion on rush for clean energy across Asia. I'd like to make three points to set the stage for today's discussions. What we're seeing is a massive energy transition is already underway across the world, but the pace is far, far from adequate. Fortunately, COVID-19 has not derailed that process. The reality also is that nearly four-fifths of the world's energy needs are still being met by oil, natural gas, and coal, according to data uh, compiled by the International Energy Agency. And, the, and actually, the share of fossil fuels in the global economy dropped by just one percentage points between 2010 and 2019, according to their data. So the challenge before us is actually enormous and trillions need to be poured in to enable this transition to take place. But the key question is, uh, we do need to make headway, but how fast can we do it? So joining me today is a, a very informed panel and I would like to introduce each one of them to you. I have with me um, Andrew Bright, Managing Director of Woodside Capital from Switzerland. Woodside Capital Partners is a global independent investment bank and sustainable energy is just one of the areas that Andrew advises on. Prior to joining Woodside, Andrew was Group Vice President at ABB. We also have with us uh, Sergey Damon, CEO of Rusatom's branch in Japan. Rusatom is one of the world's leading companies in nuclear technology. Sergey incidentally began his career in journalism, though from the management side. And today, his priority is business development for Rosatom in Japan. From India, we have with us Mr. Devin Narak, Managing Director, Syndicatum Sustainable Resources. A leading sustainable resource company, it invests in clean energy projects in South and Southeast Asia. Mr. Narang belongs to one of the leading industrial families in the country, and he has over three decades of experience in running sugar mills as well. We also have Mr. Christian Rangin, co-founder, Engage and Innovate Norway, uh, who is one of Europe's well-known strategy and innovation thought leaders. And I'm looking forward to getting some good insights from him on how the energy market is set to evolve. We're actually expecting one more panelist who is very committed to work on clean energy, and I'm hoping she can join in soon. I'll introduce her once she is in. And I'm your host for today. I'm Shafali Reiki. I'm the editor for Asian News Network. This is a regional collaboration project. It's an alliance of 23 regional news media titles. And we're trying to build, we're trying to bring Asia closer through collaborative efforts. Andrew, allow me to ask the first question to you. Uh, we're meeting just days after COP26. And one of the issues that took center stage at the meetings was the issue of financing the transition to cleaner forms of energy. I mean, some of the world's largest banks and asset managers contributed trillions of dollars to achieving this to happen. But there is also concern that as part of the process, energy prices itself will go up. And that could impact the economic recovery process that is happening in a nascent economies. What is your view on this? And taking a slightly longer term perspective, um, where do investments most need to happen? Yeah, sure. Thank you. I mean, I think if you look at the current situation, right, we, we've we've invested in in the development of, of, of wind and solar and, and, and through subsidies in a couple of countries, we, we've got the prices of wind and solar in many countries, in many places of the world, down below uh, that that of, of fossil fuels. So so actually, uh, today you can argue the more wind and solar you build, um, you know, prices are, are starting to fall. On the on the other hand, we, we don't have with wind and solar. We of course don't have all of the solutions, right? We don't have um, a good um, solution yet for for the base load, right? Uh, wind and solar are variable, so we need to add. We need to add um, non non CO two uh, base load. Mm -hmm. um, you know that could be uh, nuclear um, fissions or traditional nuclear reactors. Maybe maybe smaller modular reactors. We we could add uh, nuclear fusion. Um, 
it could be you know in a country like Indonesia, it could be geothermal. Um, you know, we could use more more waste to energy. So there there, there are a number of options, but we but we need to uh, work on those, and, and and investment is needed before they can maybe get to 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 a reasonable uh, price. I think the the other big issue, of course, is you know what are we going to do about transport, right? Um, how how are we going to um, how are we going to fuel aircraft, cars, big trucks, all that kind of thing? You know, cars can be converted to electric vehicles, as we've seen, but but trucks and aircraft this is a lot more tricky. So we need investment in, in new novel solutions. So I think the key is um, when w- we need to we need to invest in new technologies. We probably need subsidies in, in at least a few countries at the beginning to get them to a price where they're competitive uh, throughout the whole world. Um, and I think the other thing is in the short term, we, we should not confuse, um, you know, peaks and troughs in, in, in oil and gas prices, right? With we, we should not blame the energy transition for that. There's There's been <laughs> changes in, in, in oil and gas prices. They go up and down, um, and, and, and that we, we should not blame that on, on the energy transition. The, the, those, those peaks and troughs, um, and, and that is, in fact, one of, one of the issues, right, um, that gas and oil predi- prices are predictable, whereas the price from a solar plant is, is, is fairly predictable 20, 25 years out. No, I agree with you. Uh, we can't really um, blame the energy transition for um, increase in prices. In fact, actually, we ought to be increasing spending more on the energy transition given our climate goals. But for the moment, let me bring in Sergey into the discussions. Can I uh, draw you in in the point that Andrew made about you know there are several options available um, as far as clean energy is concerned. Within that, given your work, um, how much potential is there for nuclear energy itself? Yeah, thank you for your question. Let me introduce myself first uh, once more. I am Sergei Demin. I am general manager of um, uh, Rosatom's uh, branch uh, in Penn, and uh, I am regional uh, vice president of uh, Rosatom International Work uh, for East Asia. Uh, as you know, Rosat- Rosatom is uh, famous uh, as a uh, leading company in the world uh, for construction, uh, big nuclear power plants. It, it has been historically like this uh, for decades, but I should say you that, of course, we are monitoring the global development uh, in the world. And now we are also the company uh, which is uh, open and which is development uh, technologies uh, for renewables. We are also uh, producing, for example, uh, wind generators. Uh, But uh, to tell you the truth, uh, maybe it it sounds a little bit unpleasant, but I really think that uh, wind and solar uh, sources of energy uh, can be used only like additional or uh, supportive source of, uh, sources of uh, energy. And of course, it's not a universal decision for all countries because, for example, there are countries with much sun, as we know, and there are countries like most of Russian territory, uh, which uh, sometimes we don't see sun just for months. Uh, So uh, we consider uh, just uh, wind and solar generation as supportive uh, and uh, some alternative source. Uh, I think that we shouldn't rely on uh, solar and wind uh, as for just global answer uh, for uh, energy transition. Uh, uh, The real uh, key to energy transition in the future is hydrogen is in our opinion, and Rosatom is also developing uh, technologies uh, for producing hydrogen. Uh, So maybe you know that now we are committed uh, uh, to establish uh, the first uh, pilot project of producing hydrogen in Sakhalin Island, mainly for uh, delivering hydrogen uh, for 
uh, island and land and for export to Japan. Uh, but as we know, uh, hydrogen is quite expensive uh, energy source at the moment, and even in 2030 uh, years, only developed countries can afford hydrogen as main sources. So I can believe that, for example, Japan can uh, be hydrogen country uh, by 2050, but uh, I can't imagine most of countries in the world uh, can have hydrogen as one of main sources even in uh, 50 years. So let's uh, uh, not be in illusions anymore. We really think that uh, nuclear energy stays uh, and remains one of uh, the green uh, green energy. Of course, uh, somebody can argue with me that uh, we have the problem of radioactive waste in the end of the process. I understand that. But anyway, uh, now in Rosatom and in some other world companies, the right technologies of uh, 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 the finished uh, nuclear cycle, which can solve these problems. But uh, uh, nuclear energy can be one of uh, energy sources for the future. As for uh, new things in nuclear energy, so we are, as you know, we launched a uh, floating nuclear power plant, Akademishin Lomonosov, which is the only uh, floating nuclear power plant uh, in the world at the moment. And it can be the solution uh, for some countries of Southeast Asia, for example. For example, there are many countries in Southeast Asia uh, which has uh, many islands and uh, you have uh, deliver them, and maybe you have some extraordinary situation in some islands, and you can use it. We can also make uh, modular and small uh, modular reactors. It's f quite fashionable uh, theme in the world at the moment, but uh, Rosatom already is going uh, to build uh, the first on land a uh, small modular reactor in uh, Yakutia. And so it will be uh, commissioned in several years already. But as for hydrogen and nuclear energy, I should also say that uh, with regards to the use of nuclear power plants for hydrogen production, Rosatom is considering the possibility of using the free capacity of the coal NPP, which is in uh, northern part of Russia, uh, northwest part of Russia, for the production of low carbon hydrogen through electrolysis. On the pilot site of nuclear power plant, it's planned to build a complex for hydrogen production and handling. I want to note that in this project, Rosatom will use its own electrolysis plants. Uh, so nuclear power plants can be uh, uh, sources of green energy, not just only by itself, but also as tool for uh, producing green hydrogen. That sounds really interesting. Um, we'll go deeper into the issue of hydrogen in a short while. Let me draw in two of my panelists for their views on the rush for clean energy. I'd like to invite uh, David Narang. Uh, David, allow me to bring up a controversial question that uh, is being much talked about, and that is about how India was one of the countries behind you know, the change of phrase at the final COP26 statement from a uh, phase out to phase down. Although realistically speaking, you know, um, there are interests in several countries, including the United States, of course, Indonesia and elsewhere. And they wouldn't like so readily agree to a phase out. So what do you have to say to that? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Shepali. Very good question. And I love controversies. Uh, look, uh, let me tell you, uh, the situation at, as it exists in India. And as it has been also mentioned by Andrew, uh, solar and wind are 
uh, intermittent sources of power. Uh, we need base load power, which is coming into the country pretty fast. One of the things which we are dependent upon is coal. <clears throat> we don't have much of nuclear, and we don't have a large, huge capacity of hydro. So we are dependent on coal for our base load power. So if you say that uh, we should totally uh, phase out coal, in then we'll be totally in darkness. You know, there, there will be no electricity in India. Uh, we are growing at eight to ten percent a year GDP growth now post uh, COVID. So we need uh, massive amounts of uh, uh, energy uh, to meet requirements of of the citizens within the country. And the government has a massive program to electrify and give power to everybody 24-7, 365 days of the year. Now to do that, two things will, will change the dynamics and we'll start and we will hopefully be phasing out coal. One is uh, storage. Storage is going to make, is going to be a game changer. Now, at the moment, the storage uh, uh, is not affordable for Indians. But as scale goes up, it will become affordable. So the opportunity is scaling storage. Uh, you know, we need a, maybe 2 billion batteries or a billion batteries. Like we've done with COVID vaccination, vaccinated a billion people. I think we should put out a tender for a billion batteries so the costs come down. And the moment the storage costs come down, the base load power problems uh, uh, you know, take care of themselves. Second issue is the government is now going to announce a bioenergy policy, which means that as uh, all municipal solid waste and uh, agricultural residue can be used to make CHP plants, which means combined heat plants, uh, electricity and steam. So that's another game changer because those plants can run literally at 340 days in a year or 350 days in a year. That brings you base load power 24-7. Now, the, the, India cannot certainly uh, in the short term phase out coal much as we would all like it. So it will have to be a slow process. New technologies will come in. And uh, like we've done a fantastic program with uh, use of ethanol in the country to reduce dependence on oil, petrol, uh, which is now going to be 20 percent. So all these things will take place. Green hydrogen is coming in. Uh, scale, uh, scale will again bring the cost down. Um, and we are going to wait and see in the next three to four years. You've got large groups like Reliance and Adani who committed. Uh, to getting in uh, green hydrogen and reducing the costs. But it makes more sense for these plants to be in India because let's uh, take, for example, the steel uh, sector. Two of the biggest steel producers in the world are China and India. So you should have more production of green, green hydrogen here. Uh, and actually, the world should be investing in technology in India to actually make this affordable and therefore encourage the cement plants and steel plants to move to green hydrogen. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, the production has to be close to where the demand is, you know, and that would also lower transportation costs. But the second question that I have for you is like, India has promised uh, net zero only by 2070. That looks really, really late. And um, even on, even if it's 2070, do you think India can keep its pledge or do you think there are factors that might uh, derail that aim? Well, I personally feel it will be sooner than later. It will be before 2070. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, you've, you've kept the margin by saying 2070. It could be very, very fast. And second thing, let's not forget that the West has exported pollution to uh, the East. So all the manufacturing, global manufacturing now takes place in China, India, Vietnam, other parts of the world. So now it's time that the West wakes up and starts investing with a reasonable return, you know, as Andrew and uh, Christian would agree that if you invest money, you, you need a certain return to the investors and you can very comfortably get uh, up to 12 percent dollar returns in India, which investors have been getting, even if you look at the Canadian pension fund, etc. So it's time, that the you know, uh, the West opens up with banks and investors and puts in billions of dollars. Uh, at least into India, so that you have um, you speed up the process or totally shutting down coal. 
That's um, that's a good point that I'm sure Christian may <clears throat> got. Um, he's uh, well known um, in the world of strategy and setting priorities for businesses across Europe. I know that you've been doing a lot of work in energy transition, and you know uh, Devin is saying that you know the West should invest big time in India. But I wanted to get a sense from you in terms of you know this whole energy transition that is happening in Asia, and if you would if you could compare it with what is happening in Europe, um, how do the two compare? And is it is is it like way slower in Asia than Europe? And what could be the consequences? Well, for, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for for you know running this conversation. And, and second, it's a very interesting panel, and I have pages of notes here, both from Andrew and Sergey and, and, and David. You know, I I think Asia. If we also if we include China, sort of in 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 that, um, I I think Asia is fully on par, maybe even leading uh, in some some areas. Mm-hmm. And I want to go back to what David said. You know, let's put out a tender for a billion batteries. There is yeah. no uh, reliable European provider that could really meet such an order. So mm-hmm. that would be a large sort of play into Chinese hands, but, but that would be fine. Uh, and you know, the reality is that Europe has let the Chinese become the the, the current leaders in batteries and storage, uh, and that is now sort of you know trying to swing back. Um, and, and right now, both the Biden administration, the Canadians, and, and also the EU are, are, are desperately trying to build up very quickly and very scalable a, a vast, vast um, battery uh, industry. So, so, so I think, you know, are you, are you going to find good examples in Europe? Yes. Are you going to find good examples in Asia? Absolutely. Uh, are there laggards? Oh, you bet. You bet. Uh, you know, I, I have a funny story. So about... Seven years ago, I worked with a large utility in Asia, a big company, 40,000 employees, uh, you know, your, your your utility power provider. And and at the time, I, you know, invited them to explore uh, electric vehicle charging, uh, batteries and storage, solar, uh, whether it's rooftop, uh, integrated in, in the buildings, um, industrial scale, or even floating solar. And, well, probably wouldn't be surprised that it didn't really happen six years ago or five years or four years or three years, but it's happening now. Uh, and, and all of those areas are now starting to move. So, so I think that the Europe versus Asia um, is, is um, you know, both regions are, are pushing this. Uh, and then, then, then second, I, you know, I just want to pick up what, on what Andrew said. So, you know, my daytime job is a, a strategy consultant to companies and governments. But my other daytime job is investing, and I've been in, investing into um, the uh, the clean energy revolution now for well over a decade. Uh, again, um, storage, solar, floating solar, electric vehicle infrastructure, and all of these things. I mean, now it's just boom taking off. So it's it's a fantastic time to be doing what you know um, we're talking about here. Oh, absolutely, and I I think this boom is going to continue for many, many decades, which is good, good for people. But um, Kristen, I can, I also wanted to ask you about, you know, um, to look into the future and talk a little bit about, you know, how do you see the whole energy space changing? What are some of the radical changes that you expect would occur in the next 20 or 30 years? Also, you might, do you think you could, you know, um, you know, throw some light on some of the new products that might, that might come in this market? That is a beautiful question, and you know, I, I wish you gave me a week to prepare a, a really good answer because it's such it's such a big. But I'm I'm going to give you three keywords. I'm, I'm going to say uh, acceptance, ID, and capital. And, and <clears throat> the first one, acceptance. So I'm I'm teaching a program called the Clean Energy Revolution, and I started about seven years ago. And one of my opening slides is, "Does your car run on solar?" And Yes. Seven years ago, people were like, you know, that's a stupid proposition. You know, what, what are you doing here, professor? Uh, five years ago, four years ago, people go like, yeah, you know, that's interesting. And then two years ago, everyone said, yeah, of course, because you have solar panels, you have your in-home battery and storage, um, and then you have your electric vehicle being charged on your local system. So I think acceptance, uh, a lot of these things, yes, we will have in-home batteries. Yes, we will be 
largely reply, uh, relying on, on wind and solar where it is possible. And in those areas where it's not possible, we need nuclear to be a big part of the, of the mix. So except the second is idea, I think we're going to see a, you know, a, a million ideas bloom. Um, we're going to see so much innovation coming out of this space. We're going to see so much, especially on the software side, um, where you know, software really changes how we think uh, about energy and the energy transition. So it's not just about clean energy production. It's, it's so much more kind of going through the entire um, system. And then, and then finally, it's, it's capital. You know, there are going to be hundreds of billions, trillions being invested into this. And I think I want to I want to quote Larry Fink when he said, you know, we're going to see a thousand unicorns coming out of the, the clean energy transition, and and the next Googles and Facebooks of this world are very likely going to be coming out of, on the back of the energy transition. So. 20, 30 years from now, I think this is going to be a super interesting um, uh, area, but there is going to, it's going to take a lot more acceptance, a lot more new ideas, and a lot, lot, lot more capital. So, you know, Andrew, you're going to be very, very busy here, my friend. Yeah. No, actually, I'm quite fascinated with this question, and I'd like to uh, ask everyone to comment on it, mostly because, um, you know, in our generation itself, we're going to see a lot of change. Andrew, would you like to come in on just what the future looks like, looks like to you and how will it impact our lifestyles as well? Sorry, your mic is on mute. Apologies. Um, yeah, I, I guess the point is um, following a, a bit about what we just heard. In many ways, we don't know uh, everything, right? And, and, and that is the beauty of the world in which I'm involved in, right? We've got 20, 30, 40 startups working uh, to solve a particular problem. And we've got, you know, venture capital is, is now again um, investing in, in, in a big way in, into these sustainable energy ideas. And venture capital works in that they back 10 companies and one becomes a big winner, right? And, and nine don't, right? But, but they, they make a big return on the one that wins. And the point is that they don't choose the winner. They don't know the winner up front, right? And, and, and that's the way it should be. So we should not have, you know, governments and sub, the way that subsidies work trying to predict the winners. We, 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 don't, we don't know. We, we, there's a lot of big problems that we need to solve. You know, if you take hydrogen, right, there's, there, there's three big problems that remain, right, that we, we need to create hydrogen in, you know, in a green way, in a cost-effective way. We need to use it probably in fuel cells, right? Uh, a lot of the time, they're, they're still too expensive, um, not efficient enough. And we need to be able to transport uh, hydrogen and store hydrogen in a cost-effective way. That, that's all areas where we need, you know, a massive amount of, of uh, investment, right? And, and, and that's just, just one area, right? There, there's you know, transport. W what do you do about uh, air, air travel? You know, we, we don't know the answer. Um, you know, there was a company, um, you know, called Hyperloop in the Amsterdam. They're, you know, they're, they're putting um, trains in vacuum tubes and, and running underground. They're going to transport freight that way. You know, that, that's a competitor to air travel because suddenly you can travel across Europe um, in, in a vacuum tube um, as fast as you could in an airplane, right? We don't know if that's going to be successful, but venture capital... Um, is today, you know, investing in that that kind of thing. So I think that's exactly what's exciting. We don't have all the answers, uh, and therefore we don't really know how the world's going to look. But it's going to look very different to today. Yeah, I, I agree with you. We should keep the mystery as a mystery itself and just see how it evolves. But I think David wants to add into this point about how do we yeah. see things change. So, Shafali, you know, uh, I, uh, I, uh, you know, my fellow panelists have touched upon this. I think I'll, I'll give you a very quick 10-second uh, example. Uh, seven years ago, India had was a market for 50,000 or 100,000 LED bulbs at uh, 500 rupees. You know, we can, let's say, uh, we can do the maths uh, in terms of dollars. Uh, the minister came, Mr. Piyush Goel came, and he said, let's order 300 million LED bulbs. The price of 500 came down to 37 rupees. Right. Now, that's what scale does. 
and that's what investments do so what happened that the whole world started producing led bulbs they all started putting up um, manufacturing in india and now today all of us only use led bulbs incandescent bulbs have been literally phased out to get one is a problem now i believe that the future battery will be this size that's the mobile right mm-hmm. i think this is what is important and this is where money is going in now that's where europe and the us and other parts of the world can contribute because they have technology a country like well i'm not counting china because china already has huge manufacturing capacity for battery but a billion people uh, waiting to be electrified and the homes waiting to be electrified is an opportunity mm-hmm. so what the world should be looking at is to get new and in this way many more innovations will come so it's not only about consuming electricity it's also about saving uh, power and conserving energy so both come into play and how can we conserve energy how could they be smart devices how would the fridge maintain a temperature and you know go off uh, we have now uh, just to give you a very quick example and i i've done a lot of research on this there is an institute called teri in india t e r i which was earlier called the tata energy research institute now it's i think the energy research institute now what they've done is and this is globally applicable so when you're making a building and if you go 30 feet down or 40 feet down or i don't know how many meters down the temperature below ground and the ambient temperature over there is exactly the same so mm-hmm. now they have a smart building where they're sucking the air out circulating it through the wall so if it's 45 degrees outside inside the room it's always 27 degrees whether it's summer or winter so you've got technologies like this already available and by using some amount of collective effort and getting people together in a room uh, or on a video conference or countries collaborating is going to make a difference because ultimately if a country uh, like india you know tomorrow you have another problem supposing every indian had a car you know and there was no uh, alternative there would be a global shortage of oil mm-hmm. so you know uh, you, because you have a billion people using cars so you know we are fortunate that uh, a lot of research is going into this you have indigenous technologies coming out so the future is going to be as rightly said by my panelists is going to be on innovation on ability uh, uh, and reach of cap- or capital availability to these ventures one hits it you got a unicorn rest nine no matter you made your money investors have made their money and yeah. i think that's where people should look at and we should look at scale scale will bring down the costs yeah what uh, gives me happiness it will also lead to a lot more jobs and pro- probably healthier lifestyles for many of us but i'm going to draw everyone's attention now to a point that andrew just made a short while ago about um you know the three problems with hydrogen and let's let's dive into whether hydrogen really is the magic bullet for decarbonization may i invite christian and sergey to share their views on that issue and we'll come back to you david as well sergey would you like to go first yeah uh, speak first please no no uh, after you after you okay thank you uh as i told before I really think that hydrogen uh is a key source of energy for the future but we should understand that it's only for developed countries in the foreseeable future even in Japan just today I have checked market prices for hydrogen today we have price 1000 and 100 japanese yen it's about a little bit more than uh, 10 us dollars per kilogram can you imagine this price just for developing countries and japan is targeting to make price for hydrogen for 300 and uh, 30 japanese yen it means about 3 us dollars per kilogram in 2030 maybe it will be, it will become cheaper and cheaper by 2040 by 2050 etc etc but we are speaking about one of the most developed countries 
of the world. So I really think that recognizing that uh, transition, uh, that energy transition is inevitable for uh, not for, for preventing uh, global climate changes, we should understand that it will take decades to make this energy transition. There is no one universal uh, recipe or uh, solution for any country. We think that nuclear will survive, that hydrogen will be one of the main sources, and gas will remain one of the main sources of energy in uh, coming decades as well. And any attempts just to jump over some stages just seems uh, unreasonable. For example, we see today uh, in some European countries some just forcing attempts of some green parties in these countries just to jump over some stages. I think that it will come, uh, it, it, it may come to very, very unvisionable situations in these countries and the whole Europe as well. And uh, as I told, as for developing countries, situation is absolutely different. We should recognize that for uh, developing countries, even not gas, but coal, unfortunately, will remain one of main sources for decades from now. So I can't imagine when somebody in Tanzania or in Uganda now is thinking about hydrogen. Right. It's right. absolutely, uh, absolutely illusion. Maybe they will not have energy sources for hydrogen next hundred years. Okay. Let's see. Christian, what do you say to that? Is it just for the developing countries? Well, well f f first of all, uh, Sergey, I uh, I loved your, uh, your 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 straightforwardness in in, in the final quote there. Um, you know, I, I may be a little bit more optimistic, uh, but largely I I would have to agree. I, I think uh, hydrogen is not you know in any kind of way the answer, but I think in in parts of the world and and in certain segments and industries, uh, it is a, a big part of the answer moving moving forward. So I want, I want to give you one, one, spe one very specific example. And, and Sergey, this is from the developed part of the world. It's from the, from the west coast of Norway. There's a lot of projects going on right now to look at hydrogen uh, within the shipping and maritime industry and, and see how can we use and how can we test uh, large-scale hydrogen for, um, for offshore vessels, for transportation vessels, uh, and for various autonomous uh, vessels. Um, is it fully developed? No. Is it working? So far, yes. Uh, is it going to be a part of the mix moving forward? Absol absolutely. Uh, but just like you also said, you know, going down to, let's say, Kenya or Tanzania or uh, even parts of the Brazil, uh, you know, we're, we're not going to see hydrogen being a, a big part of the mix. But I think moving forward, it will be in certain markets and segments a, a big part. Um, but I'm probably a little bit more pessimistic than some of the analysis out there. And then I'm maybe a little bit more optimistic than, uh, you know, my, my friend here, Sergey. Thank you. Given its impact on climate change, uh, Andrew and David, may I ask you, how do we bring hydrogen to developing economies? Shefali, uh, uh, you know, I think hydrogen become a very fashionable word. Like when Louis Vuitton launched his Birkin bag, so all the women aspire to own a Birkin bag. I think, uh, as both the panelists have said, we need to, the technology has to be country specific. And it cannot, uh, I mean, there's no one solution for every country. There has to be a combination of solutions. And the combination of solutions will emerge uh, from within the country. So whether it's a combination of solar, wind, bioenergy, waste to energy, uh, hydro, mini hydro, uh, geothermal, you call it whatever, ethanol, it will emerge or hydrogen for that matter will, will emerge. So I'm more optimistic and I still believe that with uh, uh, the kind of global funding which is now available, 
uh, and the technologies which are now available, it is only a matter of time that uh, you know uh, uh, this will all become affordable. I mean, who could afford a large um, computer when uh, Apple launched or IBM launched? Today, you have a computing part in your watch. You know, nobody thought that. I mean, people own mobile phones even in Africa, but it will come. It will happen, but we have to wait. And maybe those countries have a different solution, which we don't know at the moment. That's what I would like to say. Sure. And Andrew, do you think financing or policy making has a big role to play in this? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, subsidies, financing, they, they can steer, um, you know, a country in a certain direction. It may be the right direction. It may be the wrong. So we have to be very careful about the way in which we, we, we choose um, the areas to subsidize. Every country has to be... Um, very very careful about that because you can you can block out by by not subsidizing certain areas or or, or forgetting uh, that they they could exist you, you you could kill the potential of all sorts of options right um, so so one has to be very careful about as I said earlier choosing the winners too early right um, we're running short of time but I do want to ask each one of you, about the priorities that businesses should set for self, for themselves after COP26 as they begin to look at COP27, you know, given the pledges that have already been made by their institutions and by their countries. Uh, we can go in any order. Well, I think the businesses should uh, try and attain the uh, SDG goals as soon as possible. Uh, large corporates have the funding to do it. Uh, whether it is by supporting, uh, not by green uh, washing, but by supporting plants uh, uh, within their community or by making more and more of the manufacturing plants totally renewable and implementing things like no use of, you know, we can go into details. But I think it is time that businesses take ownership and realize that we are doing it for the next generation and the next generation and make world a better, cleaner place to live in. Thank you. Christian? You know, I'm, I'm listening to this conversation and one of my reflections is that it's, it's going to be a patchwork of many solutions. It's, it's not going to be one big thing. Um, it's going to be, um, you know, entirely new companies like Andrew mentioned, startups that are coming up with entirely new solutions. Uh, it's going to be big oil and gas companies that are increasingly um, you know, shifting their portfolios towards uh, low carbon activities. Uh, it's going to be companies implementing electric vehicle fleets uh, like Amazon is doing. It's going to be companies building out uh, rooftop solar on all of their buildings. So I think we're going to see, you know, maybe a, maybe a, a groundswell bottom up rather than a strong policy top down. Uh, but I think over the next 10, 20 years, we're going to see a lot of innovation coming from a lot of different sources. Uh, and again, Andrew uh, providing capital into the space is going to be very. Uh, he's going to be a very busy man. Thank you, Andrew. Are you going to be providing capital? Well, you know, coming back, I, I hope so. But, but coming back to the point about the corporates, I mean, I, I think the corporates have been playing already an increasingly important role, right? In, in recent years, if you look at the, the the amount of renewable PPAs, you know, they're they're driving massive investment today in renewable power plants. I, I, I would like to to see that, you know, perhaps expand into other areas. So they've proven themselves to be kind of faster and more agile than may, maybe governments, um, and 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 certainly you know, driving massive amounts of, of, of capital investment um, in, into, you know, both the proven technologies, but also investing themselves. You know, um, many corporates have their own venture arms, which in turn invest in, 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 in you know, potential new um, disruptive solutions. So, so massive, massive role to play. Right. Sergey, how does it look for you? Yeah, I suppose is that all businesses, first of all, should be, of course, oriented to innovations. I think that everybody agrees to it. Uh, and businesses should be more socially oriented when they work historically. Let's say they should be uh, socially responsible. I think that the era and the global period of just thinking about only earning 
is over and it will lead to nowhere. That's it. That's absolutely true. I'm getting a message that the time has finished for this session. So uh, thank you, everyone. There were some very great insights in there, and I look forward to meeting you again. I mean, this conversation by no means is over, and it's definitely going to keep continuing. Thank you for joining thank today. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you.